Thanks a lot. So hi, everyone. Um, today, we will talk about cohort lipidomics. And um, as I was asked to add some uh, practical advices, I decided to include three components in my presentation. Um, the first one is the common principle for these type of studies. And the second are examples from published studies. And the third one is the, all the issues that we had to face in the lab when running some of our own studies. So I hope this will be useful for some of you. Um, so the first question is, of course, why do we need these big studies? Why do we need to complicate our lives so much? And then the answer is that, unfortunately, um, we need, uh, for many cases, we need to analyze many samples uh, to have a better understanding of the etiology of the disease that we are studying and to clarify which are the interactions between the lipidome and other variables like the anthropometric, clinical, and lifestyle factors, and also to clarify the association of our lipids with the clinical outcomes. Of course, there are many challenges when we do this kind of studies, and uh, probably the main one is that we have to be able to measure many lipids across several hundreds or thousands of samples while maintaining a sufficient quality, because otherwise our measurement would not be reliable anymore. Now, as you all know, probably the very first step uh, in any kind of project is the appropriate study design, right? And then, of course, it's the same here. So uh, first of all, you might want to choose your analytical platform if you can choose if you have a few different techniques available in your lab. And, uh, and then the second one is selecting the starting material. So the, this has to have uh, uh, specific characteristics. Of course, the matrix has to be easily accessible and have a reasonable concentration of what you want to measure. So that's why also the most of these studies have been done on human plasma or serum because it's, it's easier to have access to these type of samples. Although there are also other examples that I mentioned here uh, where uh, lipids were studied in urine and in saliva that, if we think about it, are much more easy to get, but still the studies are very limited on, this, on these matrices for, for several reasons. Um, then you have to um, worry about your procedure for collection, handling, and storage of samples. We already heard about that uh, because this is uh, important to keep the, um, your, your sample integrity. And uh, hopefully you already have a method that uh, has been validated. So you have good accuracy, sensitivity, precision, and so on. Uh, we can talk about some of these aspects. And then finally, you will have your measurement to which you have to apply some kind of statistical analysis and uh, even a bit more complex than that to get the results that will uh, associate to, to your disease uh, outcomes, hopefully. Now, Let's start then from a very practical suggestion about this first step, which is the, 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 the study design. Uh, I have two main recommendations here. Uh, they might sound trivial, but they are very, very important at this stage. One is to have a, a, a good bidirectional exchange with your clinician collaborators. And this is very important because <clears throat> you probably work in different fields and you have different expertise and Sometimes you might not talk the same language. So for example, it's important to sit down with your clinicians and discuss the project from the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because for example, you might have good ideas, but you might realize later that <clears throat> there's no uh, clinical application for that idea. And uh, your collaborators uh, need to know how to properly collect samples for you um, to be able to have good measurements. And then the second main suggestion is start small. Uh, maybe run a pilot of a couple of hundred samples. Don't start from 2,000 samples because um, in the beginning, you really need to practice a little bit. So <clears throat> what other things should you consider during prelimin this preliminary discussion? For example, uh, define well your metrics. Uh, what happened to us is that sometimes people exchange uh, the concept of plasma and serum. We know they are different, especially for lipids. The level can be different. So you 
can't or it's difficult maybe to compare for some of our lipids plasma studies to serum based studies so clarify that from the beginning um try to get as much information as you can about the history of your sample what are the number of free store cycles you know we, we we talk already about the fact that some lipids are very sensitive to these operations and was that <clears throat> was there a multicenter collection in your study so different hospitals for example might follow different sop for sample collection and then it's difficult to pull them together if you want to compare the results and that's why it's important to put in place sop for sample collection and analysis and uh, hopefully the sample if they have not been collected they can be collected and following all the same procedures and uh, if possible, and if the, the um, personnel that is collecting this sample and preparing them for you uh, don't have experience, consider offering training to them. Um, and uh, especially try to align the requirements for the sample characteristic that you need. Um, we had experience of discussing about what we thought was a very simple concept, which is uh, we need healthy controls. And then you will find out that people might define healthy controls in very different ways. So be sure that the characteristic of those sample uh, fit into the study that you and your collaborators have in mind. Now, another, another factor to consider is the circadian variation of plasma lipids. So um, this means that the time of sampling matters. It matters when the sample is collected from the participants. So you see here an example. This is a study from, from our lab from a few years ago, where 20 LT subjects were kept in the lab for four calendar days, and uh, uh, blood was taken every four hours. And you see that for some lipid classes, there is a clear circadian variation. Here you have example of TAG and DAGs, especially, but also some other phospholipids have this kind of variation. So you can understand that it's difficult then to compare people that gave blood at this time of the day versus people that gave blood at this time of the day. And uh, so be sure that at least this information is recorded. So if they weren't collected at the same time, eventually later you can understand why some of the data don't fit. And then very simple advice is about uh, materials. Um, you will realize that if you haven't run uh, big studies before, you really need to order in advance all your solvent standards, vials, plate, and columns, because uh, the scale is quite different. For example, um, we didn't realize uh, until we ran our first big study that we only had one liter bottles for the LC, and uh, because it's better to prepare the uh, entire batch of your mobile phase at the beginning so you don't have to re-prepare and then uh, that can influence retention times of course uh, we didn't have any five liter bottles so consider these very practical issues uh, prepare a single standard mix for all your samples so you don't want to prepare different standard mix multiple times because you might have variation of course and one thing that we realize is that we were spending really a lot of time just to label vials for our experiments when we were doing big studies. So you might think of using, for example, barcoded vials that are now available and uh, are also um, can also be used in 96 format. And there are specific scanners that can help you in, in reading the barcode, which is also on the bottom of the vials. Or of course, consider plates that can be barcoded um, simply uh, you, you will have a, a barcode for each plate and uh, this will make your life much easier and then um, preparation of the sample before starting your study much faster. Then um, we, uh, we have to consider the, the lipid extraction of force um, and uh, we have experience and uh, studies have been published uh, by considering different type of extraction, uh, either being manual or automated with robotic systems and uh, uh, one phase extraction. Here I just put one example, which is butanol methanol, the one that we use uh, many times, but we also have experience with two phase extractions and TBE if you want to collect your lipids on the upper phase or chloroform methanol 
if you want to collect them from, from the lower phase. All are equally good and they have pros and cons, uh, but uh, you can find publications where people used all of them. Now, uh, some considerations about these different types of extraction. Um, manual extraction, of course, is more flexible, but also demanding, especially when you have many samples and you know if you extract the sample yourself. So you might consider to engage different people and uh, to help you to do this, but uh, you might also realize that that will introduce variability in, in the extraction, so consider that. Um, when, if you have the available robotic system in your lab, um, you have to think about the samples form a compatibility. So are the samples that are coming to you from a hospital or a tissue repository compatible with the format that your robotic system uses? Do you have enough consumables? Because maybe these ones are not so easy to, to have in a short time compared to other piped tips, for example, because um, they are being more rare, and especially during this COVID time, um, the use of robotic system went to the roof really, so it's really difficult to get them um, before a few months. Consider that even if it's a robotic system, it can fail sometimes, so you better calibrate it before using it. <clears throat> uh, otherwise, you will find that maybe some of the position will not be transferred for, for your uh, uh, lipid extraction. And then what you have to think about is, um, should I extract all the samples before I start my um, MS run or <clears throat> to have you know, better reproducibility in terms of time between extraction and uh, analytical run? Should I extract batch by batch while one batch is running? Um, this, of course, depends also on what you are analyzing, of course. Some lipids might be more stable in freezers or less. And then comparison between a one-phase extraction, Michael already mentioned it in the lecture before me. Um, it's probably easier and faster, but is much dirtier. So consider that uh, if you want to use the one-phase extraction, it's good for automated extraction <clears throat> because it, make it, it makes it easier for the robotic system, uh, but it's not good, for example, if you are running a shotgun analysis because uh, there's too much suppression. And the uh, two-phase extraction is definitely more specific and clean and uh, much more well-validated for lipids, but it's also more demanding. Uh, either if you do it manually, especially, because you have to pay attention to which phase you are taking out, and uh, if you use a robotic system, it's of course a bit easier, but you have to enable the robotic system to recognize which phase to take out. Now let's come to the analytical part. And um, I will just talk a little bit about the use for this type of studies of both direct infusion techniques and LC-based techniques, both for untargeted and uh, targeted lipidomics. This is the uh, set up we have on one of our instruments where we exchange them continuously. Uh, they work both fine and then indeed you will see very good examples of studies that use both, both type of analytical techniques. So we start with the direct infusion and then shotgun lipidomic analysis. Here um, I just put some advantages and disadvantages of this introduction method and they are known, so I only highlight the ones that are more relevant for uh, big cohort studies. And uh, especially one advantage of the shotgun analysis is the analysis time, which is shorter. <clears throat> and also as most of the time is, is, is done in nano-infusion, gives you more time for multiple experiments. And the data analysis is definitely easier and faster. Uh, one disadvantage, though, might be that you have a lower coverage in terms of number of lipids that you can measure. Now, as a, as a good publication, an example of using um, uh, shotgun lipidomics for um, uh, cohort studies is this one was published on Nature Communication in 2019, and the lipidomic analysis was done by our colleagues in, in Lipotype. And uh, as you can see, uh, more than 2,000 people from uh, Finnish cohort were, uh, were analyzed. Uh, these are plasma samples, of course. Um, lipidomics profiling was done, and the level of 141 lipid species were measured in plasma. Uh, 
So what the authors did basically uh, was putting together a genome, phenome, and lipidome analysis uh, to try to clarify some links to cardiovascular diseases. Today, I'm showing you uh, three examples of publication all about cardiovascular diseases, but uh, you will see that they touch different aspects of it. So what the authors did were mainly three things. One was to check the heritability of lipids in plasma through genetic correlations. And what they found is that lipids are heritable, lipid levels are heritable. Ceramides specifically have the highest heritability and the PEI the lowest. And in general, sphingolipids have a higher heritability uh, compared to glycerolipids. And PUFA specifically have quite high um, heritability. Then the second thing they did then after that was to measure uh, GWAS um, association between the lipid levels. And they found that uh, they found several associated loci. And uh, the good thing is that they found also novel loci, um, uh, ROC1, MAF, and SIT1 associated to lipid level, plus others that were already known from previous analyses, uh, which confirmed the that the analysis were, was correct. And then the third thing, then they moved to the phenome and then they did phenome-wide association from UK Biobank and they tried to associate um, the, um, the low side that they identified to be associated with lipids to 25 different uh, uh, cardiovascular disease phenotypes. And then uh, they were able to find possible new CVD loci and uh, I don't know if you know some of these genes, but for example, I know quite well SPTLC3, which is one of the subunit of uh, the first step uh, of the enzyme that regulates the first step of the uh, sphingolipid synthesis. So this is quite uh, an interesting study that I can, I can recommend if you wanna see how these core studies are done with shotgun. Then when we move to liquid chromatography, um, of course, uh, one of the advantages is the increased coverage. So basically, uh, you will be able to measure mm, usually many more lipids compared to shotgun, of course, depending on the method, but in general, it is like that. Although this at the expense of the analysis time because the, the runs on the, on the LC can be longer. And uh, in some cases, the quantification uh, might be uh, not comparable to the one in shotgun, especially when you use reverse phase and your internal standard is not co-eluting, of course, with the, with the lipid class that you want to measure, uh, which is not the case in ELIC, for example. So uh, in this slide, I give you an example also of the application of reverse phase chromatography uh, to one B core study. Uh, <clears throat> this is a study published on, on cell chemical biology by Peter Michael Group, uh, that is one of the leaders in, in this field. And then I, I recommend to, to follow his publication because uh, he's definitely a reference um, for this type of studies. In this specific one, um, what is interesting of this paper that I recommend is that there are two sides. One is almost purely methodological, where they focus on explaining how they develop a very wide targeted reverse phase-based method that in 15 minutes is able to measure uh, more than 600 lipid species from 35 classes. So, you know, when we, when we say targeted methods, uh, we might have an idea of measuring three, four species, but these wide targeted methods are really very useful and also quite sensitive. And uh, they analyze about 600, uh, 600 samples, uh, 400 normal glycemic and 250 pre-diabetic. And then what they look at was the association of plasma lipids with uh, anthropometric um, measurements. So like age, sex, BMI, and glucose measures. And why is that? Uh, because these factors are also clearly associated to cardiometabolic risk for diseases. So they wanted to see if uh, there was a clear association between lipids and this factor, and of course, of consequence between these lipids and cardiometabolic risk. So quickly, we can go through the figures here. I put three, uh, one for each factor. 
in this one on the right, you see associations of uh, lipid species with age. And as you can see, there's a clear positive association of the sphingolipid level, ceramide and sphingomyelin, uh, especially uh, <coughs> lipids that have been already uh, correlated to uh, cardiovascular disease risks, and also to myelin sheet degradation in case of sphingomyelin. And uh, the most uh, highly associated lipid uh, was uh, acylcarnitine 14-2 and other acylcarnitines as well, probably suggesting that uh, the mitochondrial activity in aged people um, is compromised and these species tend to accumulate. Then when we look at another factor in this case, sex, um, what they found uh, interesting was that specific sphingolipids in this case, the ones containing the D18-2 long chain base uh, were 30% um, lower in male. So um, now it is very interesting. And because the enzymes that put the second double bond in D18-2 has just been identified being TAT3, now I think there will be more studies trying to see if the expression of this enzyme um, is probably is probably higher in female or if there's another reason behind that. And at the same time, they found that uh, lysopecies are higher in male. And the last factor that they consider was association between lipids and BMI. And again, there's something interesting here looking when looking at sphingolipids because simple sphingolipids are uh, positively associated to BMI while complex sphingolipids are negatively associated. So probably, in this case, there's a block uh, that, that stops the synthesis of uh, complex sphingolipids and then the, the simple sphingolipids tend to accumulate. And another interesting uh, association here is the uh, negative association of uh, lyso uh, PCs uh, with BMI. Now, we have to say that all of these were subjected to uh, multiple corrections uh, due to uh, known interactions uh, between uh, lipids and um, uh, clinical lipid measurements, such as HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and, uh, and these kind of factors. So in the end, if you can choose, meaning you have different possibilities in your laboratory and uh, you don't know uh, which approach to use, you also all, always have to look at your study and try to compromise between different factors. Uh, one is the analysis time, of course, because you have to consider that you're going to analyze hundreds of thousands of samples. The other thing is the coverage. As we said, in one case, you have a much higher coverage, um, you know, 600 lipids versus maybe 100 or 150, uh, which is the stability of your analytical system. <clears throat> Probably the LC system are a bit less stable compared to the direct infusion if you use a nanometer or so where uh, you inject sample uh, always from a different sprayer. And uh, what is your um, capacity in, in data analysis and uh, uh, shotgun data analysis is probably easier and faster compared to a CMS data analysis, but then it depends on your skills, on the software that you're using and other things that uh, I might explain later. And now I, I want to talk about quality control because as we said, um, a, a very fundamental factor in these type of studies where we have so many samples, so many lipids to measure is to have an adequate quality control. And uh, usually we use quality controls made of a pool of small volumes from all the samples. Uh, that if that is not really possible, but that is the best solution, you might consider um, alternative strategies, um, pooling maybe only selected samples if you don't have enough, or uh, use similar commercial matrices. The important thing is that you always prepare um, your QC together with the study samples and absolutely in the same way, because otherwise you will see huge variations between QC <coughs> and your samples, and that's not good. There are many types of QC samples. Um, we call QC samples all the blanks that we use. We have different type of blanks. The system suitability test. Um, <clears throat> the most used for us are the process 
batch QC and the technical QC. The first one consider uh, the influence of both the analytical system and the extraction procedure, while the TQC only the variation introduced by the analytical system. So we can separate the different effects. And then reference materials, um, standard reference material like NIST 1950 plasma and our own internal long-term reference that we use in all the studies. Um, I guess that most of you are already familiar with uh, how to use QCs, but just in case, the QCs are many use. You can use them at the beginning to condition your system, and then you intersperse them um, through your samples, uh, more or less at regular intervals, so that you can use them to normalize your data at the end of the analysis. And then you can also use them to generate dilutions um, to basically control for saturation effects and also for, for contaminant presence of contaminants. And of course, um, we don't have to say that the, the, the sample sequence you, has to be um, uh, used under stratified randomization, right? So all the distribution of the subjects in your batch have to reflect the entire distribution of those subjects in the study. This is how it looks when we run an experiment, more or less. If the red part is the number of samples, uh, the total QC account for about 20 to 25% nowadays of our samples, including all the different types of QCs. And what do you do at the end of the analysis with your QC? Well, you can use them to estimate the signal to noise ratio for data filtering, for example, so that you're sure that uh, you don't have carryover uh, or other phenomena of contamination. Uh, you use them to establish the linearity of dilutions uh, to calculate your RSD. Usually, um, we, we, we keep it uh, lower than 20 uh, to 30 percent. You can use them to make PCA to be sure that uh, the analysis went well and to do normalization eventually if you need to do some batch correction. I will show you now an example. So um, this is the importance of having different types of QCs uh, in big studies. This was uh, uh, one of our big studies where we analyzed almost 4,000 samples. And uh, in this case, you see a PCA where the blue are all the samples and the red is technical QC and the green is the uh, pool QC. So the red one monitors the stability of the system. You see it's always very stable, but here something went wrong in the sample and every, the signal went down. And, but because it happened in the middle of uh, a running batch, and we see that the red signal is stable, we kind of realized that this was not an issue linked to the instrument. And indeed, if we group the sample by extraction batch, we see that an entire extra, extraction batch, uh, batch here went, went wrong. And uh, luckily, we could use then our QC that behave like the sample to correct uh, this, this variation and then uh, to save the batch uh, somehow. Uh, but this was to show you the importance of having different type of QC because um, problem can come from different part of, the, of your workflow. And in this case, for example, uh, Mikkel just mentioned it, the importance of, if possible, having different standard per lipid class, not only one, but hopefully two or more. So in this case, for example, this is the endogenous lipids, uh, samples, and the different QC in blue and red. And you see that with one standard, you have the same behavior of the endogenous lipids, but if you only spike, for example, ceramide 12-0, uh, the behavior of this internal standard is totally different from the endogenous lipids. And if you use it to normalize your data, this, instead of helping to normalize your data, will introduce a large error. So in this case, you have a choice and you use the right standard. And uh, all this is important because you want to be able to discriminate between the technical variation here and the biological variation. This was probably the first of our big studies uh, when we were still uh, reasoning in terms of hundreds of samples. So where we measure 360 alt individuals, we measure the um, biological variation of, of lipids in human plasma in different ethnicity here in Singapore. And uh, 
what you want to have is to have a technical variation measured by QCs that is much lower than biological variation because that's where the meaning of your study uh, sits. Now, um, another important point is how can we compare different studies? Um, we need to harmonize and then we propose to to harmonize different studies with external standard references. This is something we published uh, last year. And this is relevant when, when you do longitudinal studies. So when you run samples at different times, when you wanna do multi-center validation between different sites, and even when you use different platforms in your own lab or in different labs. So a reference material has to be interspersed among the sequence and prepared uh, together with all the samples. So you can just put it inside each batch. And then what we do is to calculate a normalized value by dividing the concentration of lipid in each sample by the concentration of the same exact lipid in the reference material. So we have a relative value that is always the same and is relative to the reference material. And I'll show you an example where um, we use this method to compare results between different centers. Um, one set of samples were, was analyzed here in Singapore, another one in Melbourne. And um, uh, through the use of pool QC, we were able to compare results even acquired with different instruments. So these are the level of uh, lipids, uh, concentration measured in, in Singapore, concentration measured in Melbourne here. And you see that they, they are not quite uh, lying on the um, line of identity, but after we apply the correction that I just show you, you see how the concentration values are exactly the same for both sites. And indeed here you see a, a huge decrease of a inter site difference from average. So um, we tested this in different conditions with different comparing different methods and uh, it always worked well. And uh, oh, one, the last part, of, of the analysis you have to do is of course peak integration, right? So where you have to, to consider the, set, the size of the data that you have to manage because in case you measure 600 lipids for 5,000 sample is 3 million peaks to integrate. So you have to consider you wanna do it manually, you wanna automate it. How fast is your software if you want to do this kind of analysis? And uh, can you visualize all the spectra at the same time, if you want to check them and just scroll down on your screen. And what is the reproducibility of the software in integrating peaks? These are all factors that might uh, make you choose a specific software that might not be your vendor software. So now this is the last part. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is more data analysis that I think would be covered in the following section. Uh, in this school, and there are people that are better than me in explaining these things. It's just that there are some specific steps that you always have to go through when you do these kind of big lipidomic studies. One is the check for normality. Usually our data are right skewed. Uh, there are always high correlation inside each class. So um, eliminating some of those lipids will, will improve the power of your analysis. And you can do this by um, reduction of data dimension in several methods. And then, of course, you always have to correct for multiple comparisons. But what I would like to say is that um, what we measure is always an association. And then uh, we have to go um, beyond that, of course, and try to translate biomarker that we might find into risk assessment models, for example, to predict severity, test the efficacy of treatments and so on. So uh, I remember the first day Valerie um, was uh, pointing out at the fact that sometimes we publish these big studies and then they just stay there in the repositories and uh, we don't know how to use the data. So um, there are luckily also examples where um, people have done more than that. And then this is one of those examples and I, I would like to conclude with that. Um, this is the use of plasma ceramides to identify cardiovascular risk. And this is how it happened during the years. It started with a discovery stage um, where they use both shotgun and reverse phase MRM on about thousand samples and where they found that basically the people 
at risk had a higher concentration of sphingolipids and in particular some ceramides. Um, then following that study, they validated with a targeted uh, reverse phase MRM where they only focused on four ceramides and they tested it on different cohorts of a few thousand samples. And indeed, they found that those specific four ceramides had higher uh, hazard ratio to predict cardiovascular disease. And this test was then uh, adopted by Mayo Clinic for further validation. And uh, this year, as very recently, it was even licensed to Quest Diagnostic, which is probably the biggest lab in US for uh, clinical analysis uh, as, as, um, as a test to predict cardiovascular mortality. Now, one would think, okay, so is this the end for this? For example, we found our biomarkers and that's it. And the answer is no, of course. So I would suggest to read this, this uh, relevant essay on the, on, on the topic. And um, this came up exactly after they found ceramides as markers for these diseases. And uh, after one person were found to have um, high level of ceramides, then uh, she wrote to Scott Summers, which is an expert in, in the ceramide field and asked, so what do I do now? Can I do something about that? And then he was wondering, um, what do we know and what can we do? And unfortunately we know a lot about ceramides and uh, uh, we have a lot of information about uh, murine models and uh, how to act on, on the enzyme that synthesize them and to lower the levels there, but nothing has been done so far on humans. And so um, the, the, the final point here is there's still a lot to do even here and uh, probably a lot to do for, for, for you that are young and smart and they are attending this school. So um, enjoy all your research on these kind of topics. And with this, I would like to conclude. And I thank you for your attention. And thanks, Marie and Valerie, for having me here and for organizing such a, a fantastic school. Thanks. <laughs>